Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say uh, how encouraging this event has been. It's been uh, very refreshing to hear these things said out loud and in a public way and to find like-minded uh, people. So it's been a joy to be here. I was, uh, I had to pivot last night because the topic I was assigned was how my preaching has changed. And I was gonna basically give the Mark Serberg speech and the Joshua Shear speech. I mean, it's, it was just, it's just almost the exact same experience, really. I was reading the Bible and it just didn't jibe with what I was preaching exactly. And it didn't jibe with the sermons I was reading. Um, I, I will make a couple of remarks though regarding that. First of all, I, I love, and I have loved since he first came up with it, this nomenclature of soft antinomianism. Uh, because I think it is helpful to recognize that it is distinct from the antinomianism of the past. And also in that it is not thoroughly applied so I preached in a way that was very similar to what, uh, to what Mark described, but I did have my places where I did preach the third use of the law and exhortation and instruction. For example, I knew from the absolute beginning that being forgiven of your sins and receiving the gospel would not automatically instill information and understanding about stewardship. I always preach tithing. I've always believed in tithing. I always knew that's the way we should go. I've always encouraged people to do that. And I just knew they wouldn't get that from just being absolved. So I always preached that particular law, right? Uh, I always preached against abortion. I, I don't know where, I don't know where, what sermons scare, where he goes to church, where he doesn't hear about these things, but I always preached against abortion. I always, you know, I always preached against sexual deviancy, but there, but I was afraid to preach in a sense about like, how to, how to live the good life in the sense of uh, how to be a good husband, right? How to, be a good, how to be a good wife, how to deal with conflict, how to witness, to give ex specific examples and concrete instruction in those sorts of things. And I think that really I was just trying to not look and sound like the evangelicals. But I also want to defend a little bit some of the preaching that we did engage in in those days. In the first place, we, we, we absolutely must say at some point that law, gospel, come to the sacrament is 100% legitimate sermon outline and effective in the right way to do things sometimes. And even the performative speech, right, it has its place. The prop, soft antinomian and, on, and antinomianism, if it is a heresy, is a heresy of omission right, not commission. That's one of the difficulties in sort of dealing with it. It was just that we didn't really do much in terms of admonishing people to, holy, to, to godliness and holy living, right? But it, but it is an absolute legit, it was legit preaching. It is particularly the right sort of preaching, like at a funeral and in other, and in other places. And uh, it was pointed to the day, and I think this is worth noticing. I, so I graduated in 1996 from, from Fort, the only place I've ever graduated from, uh, Concordia, Fort Wayne, as Aaron told you. So Promise Keepers was founded in 1990. In 1997, they had their largest gathering ever, uh, estimated between 600,000 and 800,000 men gathered on the, on the mall in Washington. And it was an absolute legalistic organization right? Uh, the Prayer of Jabez was published in 2000. It was an insane sort of legalistic book, kind of a prosperity gospel. Rick Warren in 1995 published The Purpose Driven Life, and he sold millions and millions of copies of this, and it was a legalistic evangelical uh, movement. The purity movements and the abstinence pledges uh, of the 1990s were horrific, right? They'd take, they'd take to, to, to young Christians, uh, women and girls in particular, they'd get a ring, they'd make this sort of vow to be married to Jesus, and they were promised that as so far as they abstain from sexual immorality until their wedding day, they would be given a glorious wedded life of physical bliss and joy. And of course, right, as a reward for their good works. And it, and it, was, it was not good teaching. It wasn't, it wasn't true, it wasn't biblical, and it ended up hurting them. We were facing real real legalism in some sense in in these things in those days now that being said i mean you think about those particular movements and those books and things 
they were trying to respond to what was starting to, what had begun, right? Really, so I was in college in 1988 and in the university, a public university, and the gay club had just started, I think the year before. It was brand new to have a club for gay students. And I was in ROTC and they started to bring, push ROTC because in those days, some of you may remember 36 years ago, you could not be a homosexual and be part of the armed forces of America. And that meant you couldn't be in ROTC, but the university had just passed a resolution or a policy or whatever that said they didn't judge based on sexual orientation, right? That stuff was just all starting. It was the beginning of what we're now, right, seeing kind of the full fruits of. And the evangelicals were trying to address them. Promise Keepers was trying to address a real problem. I don't think they did it in the best way, but it was, but they were right to try to address it, right? The abstinency pledges, the purity movement. I mean, they were responding to things in the air. We weren't really. And that's why Missouri Synod congregations were latching on to these movements. So it, it, it was a legitimate enemy in a sense, I think. Uh, did we address it perfectly? We, did we see all the consequences? No, we didn't. I would draw a parallel to, you know, 1971 when Robert Preuss is bellying up to the fundamentalists, right? And then in the 1990s, when I'm in the ministry, we're all saying, well, you know, those guys didn't realize that we needed to also protect the liturgy and the sacraments and, 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 and so forth. And uh, I said something sort of like this to David Scare one time, and uh, he got quite angry at me. And I think he was right. He pounded on the table and he said, or his desk, he said, you weren't there. And that's right, we weren't there. You know, and I think looking back at it, what if they hadn't fought the enemy at the gate? If we, if, you know, so, so the, the wall took some damage, right? There was some consequences of the warfare. The factories, you know, had been refitted or partially destroyed, but they kept the wall intact. If we had lost the battle for the Bible, we'd have nothing. We'd have nothing, right? If we didn't have inerrancy. So, so did they do it perfectly? Did they see everything? No, but they did engage the enemy. Uh, our battle was not nearly so dramatic or quite so critical in the same way, but I, I would like to say that there, there was something going on there. And I'm not trying to defend our blindness, uh, but I think it's worth just noting. It did, it did come in a particular context. And I don't think that the preaching that was done in those days was illegitimate or had false doctrine in it. Um, but we could have done better. And we've seen some consequences of the failures and the blind spots that we had. That's been laid out. So I'm not gonna tell you all about uh, how I came through that. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what I think now maybe we can see we should be doing in preaching and the sorts of things that our sermons ought to include and we need to look for. We also, I think, need to recognize, it just came up actually right at the very end of, the, of uh, Dr. Scare's uh, presentation. And that is that as we have entered into an age now that is so openly wicked and obviously evil, uh, this does make our mission more obvious and clear, right? It is actually easier to understand in some ways. And uh, as, as uh, Dr. Scare is very much about political activism, recognizing we have to engage this in the public square. He's absolutely right. We can't be silent on that. And perfectly parallel to that, and in fact, undergirding that, in response to the particular vileness and magnitude of the wickedness of the world, there is also in our churches, or should be, an increased reverence, devotion, and godly discipline, right? A, a habituation or a cultivation of virtue, right? In recognizing what the good life is and what the gospel is, right? Because there's no gospel outside of the church. So, so it's, I, I think all of this we are, we, and we are seeing this in, in many places in our churches. Um, you know, the, the thing like large families, uh, you know, that we're seeing the joy of children in a way that we didn't see before. So all that kind of stuff goes together. And I think does actually 
or is in some sense dependent upon the work that went on in the 1990s and the 2000s for things like the liturgy and increased sacramental awareness and the reinstitution of private confession and absolution, right? And those sorts of things are, 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 are good and right, and we can thank God for it, right? The Reformation would not have happened if Leo X wasn't such an absolute comic book villain, right? He's a total, I mean, he's, he's insane. We were in much more trouble. It was much harder when we had Ratzinger, right? Ratzinger was attractive, right? Now we got Francis, it's much easier. Openly wicked popes are better for Lutheranism, right? And, and I think there's a very, it's, it's the openly wicked culture is actually beneficial to us in some ways. It's not as pleasant to live in, in a way, but it's actually good for our piety. It's good for our faith. And I think it, it can be in some ways an opportunity for us as well. All right, so what should our sermons do? Uh, I think, first of all, we need to, we need to rethink uh, the reality that, that sermons are a form of pervade, pers both persuasive speech and also uh, lectures or information giving. And we need to engage the knowledge of rhetoric. Right? And just at the most basic level, we need to make sure that our sermons actually have a thesis statement, that they make an argument, that they make a theological assertion that is then demonstrated and proved right, uh, with Bible passages uh, and with the text itself that's being preached on, and of course also other uh, illustrations and the like. Uh, how, if, you, if, you're, if you, all you've ever done is sort of think in this kind of weird, exaggerated law gospel idea, then, then how do you do this? Here's how you do it. It's as simple as this. You say, today, and uh, I was talking to Schlee about this, which was helpful because uh, I needed to pivot last night. The, uh, uh, here's what you do. You just say, well, uh, the, the parable, the Good Samaritan teaches us three things. One, that, you know, whatever. So you just, you just name it, right? Just do it the old fashioned way, right? What would Walter A. Meyer do? Preach it like that. Get, look at Walter's sermons. He does this more explicitly than anybody else, more explicitly than Luther or Gerhardt, right? So just say, this is the theme of the sermon. Here are the sub points, one, two, three. And then just make that your outline and do it. The other thing that goes along with this is it is common among Lutheran Missouri Synod preachers for them to say the thing they really love to do is teach Bible class. Well, just start acting in your sermon like you're teaching Bible class. Because the reality is we have made way too of a, way too of a big of a distinction between the idea of preaching and teaching. One of, the, one of the ways that I was moved along this trajectory, I mean, a couple of decades ago already now, but was when I realized that Luther never taught a Bible class. When the confessions say teaching, they're talking about sermons. That's really pretty much where Luther does his teaching, right? It's through preaching. Uh, so, so we got we to gotta get away from this idea that a proclamation is different than teaching. Again, that's sort of related to that performative speech exaggeration in that, in that sort of thing. Another thing that was maybe a little different in my journey along this way is that I am a reader of homiletics textbooks, which should be the normal vocation, uh, avocation of Missouri Synod preachers, but weirdly it isn't. And uh, I noticed when uh, early on I'd be reading these, these books about preaching, and first of all, I discovered the Missouri Synod doesn't actually have a corner on the gospel, because I really thought that they did. I really thought everybody else was a legalist, nobody else understands the gospel. And then I'd read these like Baptists or even these Calvinists, and I'd be like, man, that's a very clear statement of the gospel. Uh, and I was like shocked, you know? Uh, and, uh, and the other thing was that so often I've read in these, in these homiletics books this idea that we got to be very careful that we don't just preach about the gospel, but we preach the gospel. Man alive, I thought that was a Missouri Synod idea. It turns out they, it's a very common idea uh, amongst Protestants, those that have come out of the Reformation. That is, that is not unique to us. And so uh, I started to become suspicious of it and then realized that I think it's an exaggeration.
One of the biggest problems with the performative speech exaggeration is this idea that somehow if you don't say for you, or if I don't directly apply it to you, that I haven't actually preached the gospel and therefore the Holy Spirit is incapable of working. Which would mean, by the way, that reading the gospel of St. John out loud would not be able to, it wouldn't be the gospel. I don't think Jesus ever says for you in John's gospel. He doesn't have the words of institution, and that's the only other place he shows up, right? Now, uh, now I'm not against this saying for you. I'm not against the performative speech, but this kind of idea that there's a magic formula, that is a real problem. That is actually legalism, believe it or not. So, so we, we, we need to sort of rethink some of these things. And reading old sermons is a great way to see that these ideas were confused. My problem, and I think maybe uh, Marx as well, I thought the sermon was absolution. And maybe that's what Peter was getting at a bit too. I thought the whole purpose of the sermon was absolution. I was trying to convert people while at the same time complaining about church growth, having seeker services. And I thought every sermon I was preaching to unbelievers and I was going to convert them. And if I ended with a law statement, they were certainly damned because there's no gospel in the liturgy. There's no way they could have come with faith or they could retain faith. And I mean, it was, it was, it was a crazy kind of idea in hindsight, but we totally believed it. In fact, to this day, I have a hard time not making my last sentence some sort of gospel statement. I've gotten a little bit better. I think I've maybe done it twice now. Uh, it's just hard. I want, I want the last word out of my mouth to be, I really do. And I don't think that's horrible. I don't think that's a horrible thing to want. It's a horrible and ridiculous and demonic idea to think that it's somehow magic, right? Or that God doesn't work or that we're not living in this reality of law and gospel all the time and the like, right? So, so let's think in terms of rhetoric, right? And think in terms of just giving a public speech or public speaking and the normal things that are needed and are necessary for that. It's not that complicated. It's, it's not that difficult. And let's try not then simply to create, create an existential crisis every single week. I, I think about this, you know, again, right, I'm, com I'm complaining about seeker services and I'm preaching for conversion. I'm complaining about seeker services and, and I'm trying to create an existential crisis. That, that was the way that the law gospel thing kind of went. I was create this drama, right, that we were going to get people into this exact situation of Martin Luther before he discovers the gospel where he's whipping himself and he's terrified of the, right, and which, by the way, no one ever, I mean, I've never met anybody I don't think in my whole ministry who was afraid of going to hell. It just doesn't seem like they just haven't even thought that's even a possibility for them, right? Uh, uh, I always love this when you get to funerals and pastors. In the old days, the pastors used to say, well, you know, you don't need to preach the law at a funeral because the law is right there. No, it isn't. They're not, they don't, they don't see that. You know what? They see that coffin. They don't see the law. They see the circle of life. They see who knows what. They, they're not afraid of hell. They're not afraid of God. They don't believe, they don't believe God. If God exists, he's nice and he likes them, just like Oprah said. And, and that was another nice thing that Peter brought up that I've been trying to push to, to recognize that this kind of exaggerated, crazy, antinomian nonsense is exactly in line with the cultural elite, right? Uh, there, this isn't accidental, I don't think. All right, so rhetoric. Uh, and then the other thing that goes with this is I think we need to sort of then accept that sermons can be boring and that people need to learn to listen. There's been a lot of research done about the effectiveness of, of teachers and methods of teaching and the like. And it turns out that there's, if you ask the students whether or not this, the, the, the lecture was good or the teacher is a good teacher or not, and then you measure their, how much they actually have retained from what was taught, it turns out that the two groups are different because what the students will say, every one of us, what we will say, that was a good lecture, he's a good teacher, if I wasn't bored. But to really actually learn things 
requires significant effort and some resistance, and so it's often boring. Things that are good for you are typically boring, and they require effort. And we need to raise the bar on both sides of the pulpit, right? The problem, the problem with the, the laity is that they have not raised the bar for us. They, it's not just that they expect to be bored during sermons. They don't mind. They check out. Okay, it's time for the sermon. There's going to be a bunch of spiritual sayings, platitudes, right? Just, you know, cliches. All, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, great. They're, they're not even, they're, right? And then because they, 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 don't, they don't want to insult the preacher. They don't want to criticize them but they also don't, right? So they don't actually hold us very accountable. And the lay people need to hold us accountable. What are you doing up there? Why didn't you actually make a point, right? Why didn't your points make sense, right? We need to do that. Why did you waste so much time telling that story, right? Let's get to it. Let's do the work that we're here to do. We could, we, so on the other side, right? The, the, the hearers need to do their work also. It's not, I don't believe it's my job to hold your attention. I think a lot of what we get in kind of like, if you go to a pastor's conference, a district pastor's conference, and somebody comes and talks about preaching, a lot of the times what, what, the, what the presenter talks about is ways to make the sermon more engaging. And that's about holding the attention of the listener, right? And all, think about it, what they, re, they don't say it quite that way, but that's the way they're really, that's what they're really going after. And I'm saying back off. So, boy, we're getting a lot of David Scare lately. But I always think about David Scare at the seminary because he, he behaves so badly, as you all know, right? And so, and he can be maddening beyond description and sometimes. I love him so deeply, it's, it's hard to describe, actually. But, uh, but he would, when he would preach in chapel, you know, he'd be, you know how he's kind of disheveled always and grumpy and doesn't really behave during the liturgy, you know, he's looking around and whatever. And then he'd be like, he walks up into the pulpit and they would just start reading, right? Never look up at, never look up at the congregation and just, and just, just plow through the thing and then, and then walk away. And every one of us would be on the edge of our seat the entire time. Why? How did he hold us? Well, at a sinful level, he hold, he held us because he might say something funny. And he might, and he might say something kind of naughty. And so we were listening for that. That's fair. And that's part of, that's part of who he is. But it wasn't just that at all. We did have this expectation that he might say something important and interesting and insightful. And we were eager to hear it. And he didn't, he didn't spoon feed it to us, right? So, I mean, it's a little bit of a mixed thing with him. I'm not advocating to act like him. But I, but, I, but I do ad advocate to think like him. And I think that he, he has a lot to teach us about analytical thinking and reading the scriptures deep, more deeply and, and taking the risks, right, that we don't need to defend Lutheranism from the Bible. If we do, then let's get rid of Lutheranism, right? So he's very good at that. Uh, so we need to teach the people to listen. Along with this teaching the people to listen, I think we also need to hold the sermon itself in a much higher place with more reverence as a mystical reality, divinely instituted. Christ instituted preaching. I mean, this is a significant event that's happening here. It's so, I mean, have you ever thought to yourself, wouldn't it be better to just read a Chrysostom sermon? Or you want to go one better, why don't we just read the Bible? How could you improve on that? How about instead of explaining the Bible and talking the, about the Bible, if we just read the Bible more? How could you improve upon that? That would, that would be wrong, actually, to do that. Because we are called upon to actually preach, right? And that is that we're called upon to actually teach and apply, right? To explicate Holy Scripture to the people. And that is because we have, God has instituted this and he's put a man there, right? I don't mean to say that you could never borrow from Chrysostom or never rewrite a Chrysostom sermon. In fact, I think you absolutely should do that because in doing that, you'll, you will learn better how to do these things and it will also be a benefit to your people. But the preacher has an obligation to actually teach and he teaches from his own personality, experience, and understanding 
right? His own piety will, will inform this and matters because we actually believe that God calls human beings, male human beings, sorry, into the office of the ministry and that he actually calls them to a specific place on purpose. I mean, it's a sort of, it, we, we get caught up in the human side of this, you know, and so I'll, you know, we'll make jokes about, you know, we'll find out, you know, we'll find out where these men in Fort Wayne are going a week from Wednesday after Pulse tells the Holy Spirit, right? So we make these sort of jokes like this, but we do actually believe that God is at work at these things, you know, as, as, as corrupt or as human or as, as frail as they might be. And, and we, should, we should acknowledge that, that this, what's happening is this is God's man whom he sent here to preach. And this is a holy activity. We should, come to the, we should come to the sermon with a reverence not dissimilar to that that we come to the sacrament of the altar, right? On both, again, both sides of the pulpit. I think that most anti-clericalism in the history of Christianity has come from the clergy. I think that one of our problems is we are embarrassed by the authority that we have and we're afraid that people will think that we think we are better than them. And the last thing we would want is that. So we prove that we're humble in our pro. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? Listen, this is the authority that you have. Exercise it. Can you imagine apologizing to, a fi to your five-year-old son for, for making him go to bed? Hey, you know, we're all equals here, right? No. Right? No, come on. You know, not, and I, I'm not, and, and this doesn't mean you lord it over them, right? I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, but, but this is the, exer the exercise, the authority that you have been given, right? According to your office. And don't be ashamed of it. Don't apologize for it in, in that sense. Uh, okay. The other thing that I think uh, if we're going to do this, if we're going to actually start teaching in, in our sermons, at least on occasion, sermons are going to have to get longer. Will the people like this? No, they will not. Too bad. Do the children like eating broccoli? No. Right? I, I think it's just, it's, just, it's just a reality of it. it is, there, there is a lot of Paul McCain in the back of my head, Mark. Right? Uh, this is one of the things he complained about. So I think we got to, again, we just got to say that, yep, I'm going to take the time that it takes. You know? But also then, of course, if you're going to do that, don't you dare waste their time. Right? Get to the point. Make the point clearly and concisely, prove it. The biggest time waster in sermons is stories, right? The, and and I, I really, I, I'm really, once in a great while, a brief story can be effective. Most of the time, uh, the, the best sort of illustrations are not stories, they're just simply analogies, comparisons, right? You know, I didn't have to tell you a long story about a father telling his son to go to bed. Right? We, could just, we could just do it in a sentence. And, and that sort of thing is absolutely needed, right? Uh, but, uh, but it doesn't have to be drawn out. So don't waste their time if you're going to make it longer. It, it needs to be actually full of doctrine, right? Biblical truths, applications. The next thing is, uh, I think in this regard, is we need to get better at exegesis. We're bad at exegesis. We think we're good at it. We're not. Um, and I think the reason we're not there's probably lots of reasons, but, but I think the main problem is we just don't know how to read. We don't know how to, to read an article in a journal and know what the thesis statement was and know what the subpoints were. We don't know how to summarize. And we come at reading the Bible as though it's an utterly distinct exercise from reading anything else. And it isn't. It isn't at all. Right? You should read, you should read the Bible the way you read a novel. The, rate, the way you read an article in a business journal, it's the same, it's the same skill. It really is. Um, and so to learning to actually read for content, to pay attention to the rhetoric of what you're reading and the, and the other aspects of this is very important. And this requires, for the most part, because mostly what we're, or a lot of what we read in the Bible is narrative. So if you're reading the epistles, you don't need this quite as much. But when you're reading narratives, you need imagination. And ancient literature is different than modern literature in this regard. It requires more, right? Modern novels, they just, you know, paper's cheap, ink's cheap. They can just blither on and on. You know, she turned to him with a twinkle in her eye and smiled as she said, right? All of this kind of stuff. 
But in the Bible, like in the Psalter, right, you could even switch who's speaking without even telling us, right? Homer does this too, right? They, they, so, so you have to actually pay a lot more attention to, to know these sorts of things. And, and the clues aren't there. They're not spoon-fed to you like a modern novel. Uh, so you have to read more carefully, more deeply. You have to pay more attention. But we should read this as things that actually happened. We were taught at the, I was taught, or I learned, I always got to try to be careful. I don't blame my four professors. Whether they taught it or not, I came out of the seminary with this idea that the worst thing I could do would be read between the lines, because that would be speculation. And the reality is you need to actually engage your imagination and remember that Jesus is, is a man, right, standing on earth when he's talking to people and that there's all of these other things going on, right? So, so all of that kind of stuff, to engage the imagination, to become better readers, right, and in, in have the sorts of skills of good reading. We also, I think, need to go back to this this five-fold use that is proposed by uh, Walther's pastoral theology has an entire chapter about how to write a sermon, and it does not sound like his book, Law and Gospel. And he goes through the five-fold use in a very thorough way. Of course, the five-fold use is also in Gerhardt. It's also apparently in Reinhold Pieper, but I've only seen the articles about it. I haven't read that book. It's not in English yet. Uh, but, uh, but, but we need to sort of think about this, right? This fivefold use thing, that this is what scripture is given to us for according to scripture, right? Doctrine, uh, correction, rebuke, uh, training and consoling, right? Sometimes they use different words. It's mainly doctrine, right? God's actually revealing himself to us and revealing who we are and what this world is to us. Uh, and, you know, lots of times that corresponds in a kind of obvious way with observation, but not always, right? And it ought to be and typically is more clear in the Bible than observation, but observation can be brought along to help it. Has anybody read this book by Eli Finkel, The All or Nothing Marriage? Well, that is really a shame. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, he's a Jewish psychologist. He wrote this really great book on marriage that all the pastors should read. The thesis of this book is more or less lower your expectations. Uh, he, he really is, the, the, the secret to marriage is, the problem, what's destroyed marriage in America is, we expect, uh, we have this fantasy of a soulmate who's going to fulfill me in all ways and provide for all of my needs, and that's an impossible standard, right? So he says, look, marriages go through seasons, there's times when it's hard, don't quit, keep going, don't try to make your spouse be everything for you. And the most essential thing, keep the eighth commandment. Oh, he doesn't call it that. He says, be careful that you don't destroy in your mind the character of your spouse because you assign motives to him. It's completely the eighth commandment. So your husband leaves his socks on the floor every day. You tell him, I don't like that, right? You should put your socks in the hamper. That's difficult for me. You're making work for me. And he says, I don't, didn't mean it that way. I'm sorry, I'll try better. And he still fails and fails and fails. Now you could decide in your little black heart that he is a dirt bag and he does this because he doesn't respect you. And if you assign that kind of motive to him, according to Finkel, you will destroy your marriage. And he's right. And he learned that by observation. Now, that's a very helpful thing to learn from him and to go, you know what? The Bible talks about this too, right? This is just simply the eighth commandment. Our marriages are destroyed for the most part by violations of the eighth commandment, not the sixth commandment in the first place. Marriages are restored by the eighth, by keeping, by the third use, right? By keeping the eighth commandment, by learning to speak well of one another, to look, love covers a multitude of sins. My husband leaves the socks on the floor not because he doesn't respect me, but because he has a weakness. And I'd like him to do it better, but I'm not going to just keep nagging him. I'm going to just accept this as a small thing that I can do in love for him because I know also he loves me. That marriage will last, right? So, so this sort of, this sort of uh, thinking about things is very helpful, right, to see this from observation, but it's got to be drawn back to actually, right, 
It's more clear in scripture. And we should be unafraid to actually teach these things, to give these kinds of examples, these exhortations uh, uh, and the like, right? That's, that, that you can take right out of that and you can think about fivefold use, right? There's doctrine there. To, to be taught about what we owe our neighbor, how husband and wife live together, right? There's correction there about false doctrines that people might think that the purpose of, of, of my husband is that we're perfectly equal in this marriage, and if he fails on his part, I'm given up, right? A kind of worldly view, and, 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 and so forth, right? Uh, so correction is against false doctrines, particularly false doctrines that people are facing in the world. Right? We need to address the real issues that people are facing. I mean, it may be different in every place, right? I, for example, have never ever had a member who was a Nazi. Now, if it happened, it'd be absolutely horrific. But it just isn't a dominant problem in my experience in my ministry. I've never known, I've never known a Nazi. I know, I know that they exist, and I think they're terrible, and I don't want them to exist, right? But I also, you know, I haven't had a problem where I have people that believe in unicorns either. You know, I mean, whatever. I, you, don't, you don't know. I don't have people tempted to Islam, right? There are people that do have these things. I'm not, I'm not dismissing them. But, but it's easy to sometimes, I think, go after, right, low-hanging fruit. I'm going to preach against Islam because it's bad, and all my people are flag-waving, red-blooded Republicans, and they'll love it. That's not really the right use, right? We need to rebuke actually where they live, what their problems are. You know, maybe we need to preach against Donald Trump. There's plenty to preach against in Donald Trump, right? Uh, so, you know, we, we, we need to tailor these things and to recognize. Uh, so training has to do with teaching people to have hope in the midst of suffering, right? Often the theology of the cross is misapplied when it's simply victimhood, right? Oh, right. The, 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 look, the theology of the cross is life is unjust and you're suffering and you shouldn't and we feel sorry for you. But really the theology of the cross needs to be pick up your cross. You're a Christian and follow Jesus. Imitate him, right? That you pick up your cross and carry on because you believe in Jesus and you have hope. And I would just submit the book of Job, right? Who gives, who gives Job that cross? God the Father does. That actually, Job, I preached on, this is another funny thing, how my preaching has changed. It's very hard for me still to this day not to preach on the Gospels. For the first time in 29 years on Easter Sunday, I didn't preach on the Gospel, I preached on Job. Uh, Job is a trickster tale. God the Father he tricks the devil into doing his own work so that, God, so that Job's faith is strengthened through suffering and his idols are removed, right? God sets it up. He says, hey, do you know about Job? He's great. And, and, and what does Satan say? No, he isn't. He doesn't really love you. He just likes the stuff you give him. And Satan's not completely wrong. But in the midst of this, Job has faith, right? He makes this great confession. I know my Redeemer lives. And at the end, he gets the rebuke and his faith is strengthened through this because now he knows. It's a beautiful story and it's a wonderful, there's a lot of doctrine in there, right? How do we suffer? Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. It took so long on this stuff. I really wanted to talk about, okay, so that's it. One more thing, uh, I'm gonna I'll jump, not yet, quite, almost it. I want, the other thing we need to recover is allegory. Uh, we, I, again, was taught, I was taught falsehoods in some sense, or I learned falsehoods on allegory. And I was going to make fun of a little bit, I was going to try to be nice, but Raymond Serberg, because he, he makes this um, statement in 1953 based upon the Christmas postal of 1522 for Luther, where he writes, uh, Scripture shall not have a double meaning, but shall retain the one that accords with the meaning by the words. And then again, the Holy Ghost is the most simple author and speaker in heaven or earth. Therefore, his words cannot have more than one, the most simple meaning. If we concede that scripture has more than one sense, it loses its fighting force. 
And then uh, Raymond Serberg says, the abandonment of the allegorical method of exegesis by Luther and the use of the historico grammatical method was an accomplishment whose influence dare not be underestimated. Now look, Raymond Serberg was on the right side of about everything, right? And, 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 uh, but he's wrong on this and he misunderstands, I mean, I, it's, it's, I would say that it, if it was a, a great uh, a great feat and accomplishment, it was the near absolute severing of church history so that we can love the doctrine of the early church while despising the way they read the Bible and thinking that we are better exegetes than they are. But I'll just give you real quick, because this is fun. So uh, that same sermon, that exact sermon that Serberg finds, you know, one of these statements about Luther, which Luther makes frequently, about there's only one use. In this same sermon, uh, he, uh, he, he says, here we go, uh, that, Christ, that Christ being born at midnight indicates that the world is in darkness. That's allegory. The light that shone around the angels shows us that the gospel is not apprehended by human wisdom. Well, that's the literal meaning, isn't it? That the angel that announced the birth of Christ to the shepherds is a type of modern preachers and the shepherds of modern hearers. That the name Judea, which means confession or thanksgiving, means that no confession but the gospel teaches Christ. And that Bethlehem, which literally means house of bread, means that without the gospel, there is nothing but desert on earth and no confession of God and no thanksgiving. He also claims that the swaddling clothes are nothing but holy scripture in which Christ the truth lies wrapped up. He says that the four soldiers who crucified the Lord were prefigurations of all bishops and teachers in the four parts of the world who tear the gospel and kill Christ and faith in him. He proclaims that the manger is the gathering of Christian people in the church to hear the sermon. That is, there we are the beasts who feed upon Christ. He nods to the healing of the ten lepers in an allegorical way when in this very same sermon he says, Christ is the priest, all men are spiritual lepers because of unbelief. And later Luther claims that the phrase evening and morning in the creation account refer to long gospel because night is dark and morning is light and teaches that the swaddling clothes have two sides, the outward part which is rough and that which is close to the skin is soft. And this refers to the Old and New Testaments. Uh, finally, he said, I'll just read you this one more paragraph. The shepherds indicate the, the shepherds indicate this in that they are found in the field under the sky and not in houses. Thus, they do not cleave or cling to temporal goods. In addition, they are in the field at night, despised and not recognized by the world, which sleeps during the night and likes to strut and be seen during the day. But the poor shepherds are up and working during the night. They represent all the lowly ones who lead a poor, despised, unostentatious life on earth and live under the open sky subject to God. They are ready to receive the gospel. The fact that they are shepherds means that nobody should listen to the gospel for his own benefit solely. But each one should tell someone who has, who has no knowledge of it. For whoever believes for himself, that one has enough, and he must see to it from then on how he might bring others also to such a faith and knowledge. All right. So anyway, there's just ton It's hilarious how allegorical Luther is while, while dissing allegory. We need to rethink how we're reading the scriptures so that we read them more deeply. We ignite the people's imaginations. And we didn't get to it, but we need, we need to actually admonish people and give them spiritual counsel and advice about how to, how to live in this world as Christians. Sorry, I overstepped my bounds. Yeah, I can so. Don't you think we kind of misapply speech and act theory when we think it's only about that, that you have to do something with your message by saying, you're forgiven, you're a superior. Whereas other types of speech can be really effective. For instance, you're explaining how the Eighth Commandment can tear apart marriage. You just explained it to us, and yet it, it had an effect. And, uh, so don't you think we got to misapply the idea of speech? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't know enough about the speech act theory as a distinct topic. So I, I don't know, so, but I but I agree that that it, it can't be right that we think that's the only way to to make an impact. Is that? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so uh, I think we agreed upon how we were using 
with about 33% adult converts. Uh, out of that number, I think the vast majority of them are like evangelical of some sort. Uh, so myself included, we've been hearing these sermons that are their use of the law and will kind of some sort of state. So what what is CFW will forget? Like promise keepers or the or you get it wrong. They're both extorted. Mm -hmm. So why is welfare what is what is welfare mean, right? And how do you essentially allow that in the you know in the mind of this is still right, but this is how you do it. Yeah, thank you. I think this has to do with really what is legalism. We were talking about this last night, and I really think what legalism is as to, is to teach as doctrine the commandments of men. And, and so the difference would be is that if we make false promises, right? You, if, you don't, if you live a sexually pure life, then when you get married, it's just going to be, you know, a great, wonderful, physical joy day in and day out, right? That's it's a false promise based upon... I mean, so I think... When, when we do exhortations, we give spiritual counsel, it's advice, it's not, we're not laying down laws. So like in the confessional, right? So if, if somebody comes and says, uh, oh, I, I hate, I mean, I just, just like if, if somebody comes and confesses a sin, this is something that's, that's never happened to me. So somebody comes and says, I'm a shopaholic and I, ste I love stealing stuff and it's hard for me to resist, right? Uh, okay, right, and I'm sorry, and I want to do better. It, it would be, comp you know, th it's legit for the pastor to actually maybe give spiritual counsel. So he might ask some questions, like, what fruits of repentance have you borne on this, right? And, you know, it, and she might say, or he might say, oh, I, I don't know, I'm none, I don't know. And he's like, well, what, what do you think? Like, what, what are you going to do? What are your actions? In the, in the original, it's complicated, but it seems to me that when we look at the doctrine of penance in the early church, before it gets completely corrupted, that's what was going on. So the idea was, you're struggling with sin, you're absolved, now here are some spiritual exercises that you can do to help resist sin and to strengthen your faith. Pray the Our Father. Now the problem is, right, they became, one became dependent upon the other, but but to give spiritual counsel and say, well, you know, okay, you're struggling with this sin. What are you doing? I don't know, nothing. Well, are you reading the Bible every day? Do you have a structure and a plan to read the Bible every day? Do you pray every day? Do you have a structure and a discipline to, to, to help you, encourage you to do that, right? Not that, you know, you can't be absolved, you don't do this, but, you know, how are you living out your life? How are you resisting sin? So I think the difference is, in terms of kind of advice and not making it doctrine of God, but, uh, but right, but looking to how to actually help people make these decisions and to help them recognize the theological reality of what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. You began your presentation with a series of kind of responses that were not full or the best kinds of responses. So you know, you were the dichotomy of the, the standards of serving your sinner, God will she go to sacraments. And that was a real response to what we were seeing in those days. And then you pointed out with your interaction with Dan Skinner. Like you weren't there. Did they did we do it perfectly? No. Is there anything in thinking about those various missteps or imperfections that you learn as we move forward and face the things that we are facing now so that we are less. Well, I think for one thing, I, I would want to be very, we don't want to lose that kind of preaching. I don't want to lose that kind of preaching. I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, again, there are, there are texts that actually, it, it, that fit perfectly with it. It is an absolute legit way. So I would say we don't want to fall off the wagon on the other side now and say, all we're going to do is preach these, you know. Uh, the other thing, by the way, I think that I didn't get to, but I think one of the differences between us and the evangelicals is Christology, that we're preaching these things in a Christological way. Um, but 
but I, that would be one of them, I think. Um, and of course, we do need to to bear uh, uh, this reality. So I had a whole bunch of we have a there. Jesus does his preaching is summarized by repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus does preach repentance. He does tell the disciples to repent. And at the end of Luke and the gospel at, at the his admonition is right that that the for, preaching that repentance and the forgiveness of sins would be preached at the end of the year. So I mean <clears throat> this sort of preaching and and the attempt to use the law that's another thing. I'm Okay, God's God uses the law the way He wants, but as preachers, we have an intent to communicate. We're not in control of it. I get that, but we should know what we're doing. So one of my problems with allegory, uh, and in terms of what we're not doing with allegory, is that we are allegorizing, but we don't know we're doing it, and then we do it poorly. So Luther doesn't think he's allegorizing, but he is. I'm not against allegorizing, but I want to I want to allegorize with credibility. I want to allegorize in a way that's actually fair to the text and is disciplined. And I did it on purpose. I didn't just slop into it as just spiritual talk because I don't know what to say about this text. And I think, you know, when we when we preaching the law, we we can we can preach first, second, and third use distinctly. We can't control the way that God uses them, but as a speaker, I can intend, you know, to tell my kid, if you do this again, here's the consequences, right? First use. And, you know, can I keep that from accusing him because he already did it? No, but, right, I mean something by that, or if I'm exhorting or encouraging him. And I think one of the ways we've gone wrong when we were trying to respond to a misuse of the third use of the law, that's another thing we didn't talk about, but there was a confusion about that that had to be corrected, uh, is that we got this idea that, you know, we'll just say stuff and we'll let God use it. And I think that's um, negligent. Yes, sir. Thank you for the presentation. I have been answering two questions. And what you want with that. Yes. Um, you gave pretty specific counsel on how to structure a sermon. In other words, how to compose a, and you suggested it should be a lengthy text. And in the same presentation, suggested that anyone doesn't know how to read. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I taught it to Great Chicago for six years, and we complained often the students couldn't write. But the real problem was you can't write if you can't read. So I'm curious about your counsel for learning to read, which I know sounds like a crazy question, but you brought it up. The other question I had is kind of related. Uh, you said Luther did teach Bible studies, therefore, I just said before, but do your sermon like Bible said, but he did lecture in the university. There's still a genre distinction to be made there, isn't there? Yes. Yeah, that's fair. There is a genre distinction to be to be made. I think we've, uh, and I, I wouldn't say we should drop it completely, but I think we've we've made it too distinctly. Was was is my point. So I I I I'm not saying there's no difference, but I think we've made too much in terms of learning to read. There are you know really, to take an English class at a university. I mean you can take a there's a great course you know from the teaching company. On, on how to read a book. Uh, there's a book by Mortimer, right? I mean, there are things out there. Uh, mostly, I think, uh, and, and maybe I was too harsh, and so I mean, that wouldn't be the first time. But uh, if, uh, I think in many ways, it's just for us, it's mostly a mindset. I think the real problem is, is that we come to the scriptures as though it's I don't know, we, we just, we, we go into a weird mode where we don't pay attention the way we would naturally if we are reading a novel. And we don't engage our imaginations. We're terrified of speculation, right? Oh, that's spec, you know, that's like the worst thing you could be told. When I was a student at Fort Wayne, the worst sin was not the one against the Holy Ghost, it was speculating. So, you know, it, so I think a lot of it's just that. But there are tools to learn to read better and reading literature, I think would be another thing, you know, to, that would help us learn better how to read the Bible. So I hope that helps some. Well, I, I just feel bad for Mark and criticize him. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, my internal example is a 33 uh, degree uh, Freemason. So, very good person, much better than this. Oh, well, uh, anyways, uh, I want to talk about just giving advice. 
and have you talk about it. I was texting with Esbitt about the conference uh, last night, and and he was uh, telling me about this couple that he uh, uh, had talked to and how their pastor refused to give them advice because he says, I'm only a preacher of the gospel. And I wonder if a lot of this from the pastors is they don't want to give advice because they don't want to take advice. <laughs> and it might have to do with malformed conscience. So I'm curious. If That's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, giving advice to, uh, to members can feel a little bit risky also. Uh, or, you know, you can just feel out of your, like, I don't know. You know, you're, you're fighting with your spouse and, you know, the Bible doesn't really give very specific advice about exactly what to do. So when you when you start saying things like, I mean, really, we're, we're taking advice now from our own experience, what our mothers and fathers were like, what our marriage is like, maybe what we've read in pop psychology books. Right. And so, you know, I might say to a couple that's that's struggling with this. Uh, for example, typical, kind of stereotypical thing, the wife will say, right, well, you know, I want him to hug me, and, and you know, it, it, the only time he wants to hug me is if it's for, you know, the marriage bed, and, and then he'll say, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to hug her just when she says that I should hug her because, you know, I don't, I'm not really feeling it, and now if I hug her, I'm just doing it because she told me and it's not sincere. I mean, that, that's like a typical conversation, right? And, you know, so now I don't have a Bible passage to back this up uh, exactly, but I'll say to him, look, you idiot, you can control your arms, just hug her, right? You can't control your passions. You can't make yourself feel in the moment, but you can act in an external way and you can control. And it's not unlike, you know, forcing yourself to say the creed out loud and not giving voice out loud to the terrible things you're thinking in the back, right? You can control this and you should, and you should act according to the vow, right? That you will love her, not that you will feel in love. So, so I might get, I give, just hug her, just do it. If she says she wants to be hugged, hug her, period. You know, and I might even say things like, look, you know, why don't you just establish some kind of routine that you don't leave the house in the morning without saying goodbye and giving her a kiss? You know, I mean, I don't say this is what you got to do. I don't say it's a French kiss. I don't say, but I'm telling them, right, look, you know, but but I'm giving them some idea about how you 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 work this out in a kind of practical way. I think it does feel a little bit risky. It's kind of like that speculation thing. It can feel a little bit like I'm talking as though I'm an expert in this. And, and the, the two, in terms of the malformed conscience, yeah, because I can be thinking very much, boy, I, it's not like I'm living in this paradise on earth with Mrs. Peterson, you know, and we got everything figured out. And, we're, you know, so so, I mean, I think maybe there's there's several things going on there, but this is this is part of our call, right? To admonish them to holy living, to give spiritual counsel, to actually attempt to help them to apply the Bible to their own lives. What does it mean to live as a husband and a wife? I don't have a Bible passage that says, give her a kiss in the morning, but I think there's great correspondence between that and the way that we, we, we see, for example, in the Song of Songs, and this idea that we should delight in one another and so forth. So, I don't know. I think I think those are probably the things behind it. Yes, sir. I think we're all better having heard this excellent uh, use of the third use of the law in your exhortation to us to be better preachers. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, you uh, have channeled your namesake uh, very well. For St. Peter says, uh, if any can speak when the speak is the oracle of God, uh, there is something that's happening when we step in the pulpit. The Holy Spirit is active. And we have no problem seeing what Weston says about sweet, mystical communion. But there should be in our hearts that we're inclined to, to speak of the Methodist, not the Methodist. <laughs> but um, that it's, it, there's something sweet, mystical proclamation that, that, that's happening as the people hear from the voice box and the preacher to their ears the communication of the Word of God. So thank you for that. Um, and I hope that we're all better preachers for pause. But here's another thing. Here's my <laughs> question. Um, what is your exhortation to the 
two pastors today in regards to uh, the preference that, that, that maybe we should have for the historic lectionary and how the, the historic lectionary may communicate the Christmas of the law uh, better than the better than the three. Thank you. All right, I don't have any idea how to answer that, Bill. Uh, I mean, I, I could give you lots of reasons why I think that the, th the, the historic lectionary is superior for catechesis, you know, uh, for long-term spiritual formation of the congregation, but specifically how it's distinct in the third use of the law, I, I wouldn't, I don't know. Well, and maybe part of is because I don't know anything about the three-year lectionary, really. So, pretty hard to compare. <laughs> so, thanks for that, though. Yes? The two types of preaching that I have set under my whole experience, one is the dog gospel paradigm that you mentioned, where before you even look at the text, the pastor, you know, is going to speak to a lot of person and go, stop there, no matter where the, where the text is stopped. The other kind is the fairly strict expository preaching where they go right through the text. If it starts on the gospel, he starts on the gospel. If it starts on the law, he starts on the law. And where it ends, he ends. And that was attractive to me as superior of letting God decide how this should end. Until I thought about the fact that the people who set up the pericopes decided where it ends. <laughs> okay. And so what would you say about mainly following the text, but being aware that sometimes the story doesn't really end where the pericope does, or it didn't begin where the pericope began? And how does that affect the way you preach? Oh, okay, so that's that, great. Thank you. Uh, two things. First of all, I was going to say this, we didn't get to it. There is a big difference between a sermon and witnessing. A sermon is an exegetical act. Sermon is systematics. I mean, uh, witnessing is systematics. Right? When I witness to somebody, I cherry pick passages, right? I bring them, I'm going to tell them the God, I'm going to tell, I'm going to preach long gospel to them, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to pick passages to do this. Uh, and when you preach, you're, you're actually, I mean, in our context, right, you have an assigned text that you're going to explicate and apply. Uh, and that's a different activity that I think is, is significant. Now, in terms of, I think that the, the part of the job of the preacher, he does his study, but uh, he needs to actually choose then something from this text to explicate. The idea that expository preaching is going to be a thorough teaching of everything this text says is a fantasy. Uh, it is the pastor's responsibility to try to choose, right, to, dis to distill this down into a message, a thesis, and then subpoints. And it might follow nicely, especially if it's a narrative, you know, kind of the structure of the text or the order of the text. But I, I, I would say, you know, most of the time it's not going to. You're going to go, here's a doctrine that this text teaches or that this text illustrates or touches upon, and so I'm going to go there and, and, and use this. And it's not going to be expository in the sense of, you know, just going going through it. Does it? So I think we're actually called upon to to make these, to use the to use our discernment to the best of our ability to to choose something to try to put it out. I, I'm, I've never said, I don't think in my life, that I know what the people need. That always makes me uncomfortable when you guys say that. Like, I'm the pastor. I know what they need. I'm like, I'm the pastor. I do not. But, you know, I'm, I'm you know, you're, you're uh, but you are making the choice as the father, right? Or, you know, I'm going to choose what they're having for dinner. And I'm going to choose something that's healthy and good, you know, and that I think will benefit them. You know, does it have the exact balance of nutrients that they need? We trust God to take care of these things, but we ought to, but we ought to put forward a balanced meal. 